Welcome back to Sociology 226. This is Patricia Hill Collins, video two. In this video, I've got three tasks. In the first, I'm going to look to the positive contributions made in black feminist thought. Next, I'm going to look to the work of Kimberlé Crenshaw and the concept of intersectionality. Finally, I'll get you ready for your two paragraph response. Let's do it. Whereas in the past video, I contrasted Smith and Hill Collins, focusing on critiques, here I will look to the three major contributions that I read in black feminist thought. They are the consolidation of the black feminist tradition, the concept of the outsider within, and the rejection of either or thinking, and the focus on intersecting oppressions. I'll deal with each in turn. The book's first major contribution is the consolidation of the black feminist tradition. Patricia Hill Collins was not simply trying to make trouble for white feminism. Black feminist thought isn't simply a book that talks about oversights. Hill Collins assembles various instances of black feminist thought together. There is no single or final account of black feminism, says Hill Collins, but there are threads that flow together. We find extensive quotation of Angela Davis, the poet Audre Lorde, the famous 19th century black feminist Sojourner Truth. The black feminist tradition is alive and well. It did not start in 1990. The aim is not only to find a philosophical or sociological analysis of the situation in which black women find themselves, but to isolate the cultural standpoint through which power and resistance have unfolded, even if they did not take the forms that Marx and Foucault would explore. The first major contribution of Hill Collins in this work is to show us that black women have spoken out about power, authority, and exclusion in important ways and that we can find a coherent expression of their situation should we do our homework. The next major contribution is the concept of the outsider within. Patricia Hill Collins aims to explore how power and authority do not simply follow the binary paths we find in the logic of oppositional difference between men slash women, fact slash opinion, oppressor slash oppressed, and so on. These are the dualisms that have ruled the dominant order in Western society and continue to rule in feminist frameworks that do not adequately challenge them. We have to look at how the act of inclusion itself is an outcome of power relations, about how mere presence does not necessarily lead to inclusion. What are the costs that one must bear in order to be included in a racially dominated order? What costs must black women bear to be part of the feminist tradition. Hence the understanding of the outsider within the young black feminist found herself to be when she was attending Brandeis. Here inclusion wasn't a zero-sum game of having made it or failed to do so. Not either slash or, she argues, rather both hyphen and. Moving beyond the binary pair of winners slash losers and men slash women is crucial for the third contribution made by Hill Collins. That would be exploring intersecting oppressions. Here we find Hill Collins' matrix of domination, which refers to the coexistence of power and privilege. In the quote you see here, Hill Collins is addressing the simultaneous penalty and privilege possessed by white women. You can also think of the simultaneous privilege and penalty of your white male disabled professor. The point, we cannot simply think of power and privilege as opposed, says Hill Collins. They always coexist. Hence both and. I think a really important aspect of this is the two frameworks of power that we found in Foucault, sovereign and disciplinary. One was the power of the king, the other one microscopic power that flowed through all relations. Well, Hill Collins asks us how well the move from one to the other explains the place of black women, who, she asks, is most often subject to the explicit power of the law. You needn't look too far to newspaper headlines to find the answer. There is a racialized aspect to this, passed over in Smith, and certainly not emphasized significantly by Foucault. We cannot lose sight of oppression as oppression. But, and this is crucial, we can't come up with a single definition of oppression. We have to look at overlapping systems of power and authority, inclusion and exclusion, and how individuals are situated therein. This she calls intersecting or interlocking oppressions, plural, what would come to be included in the term intersectionality though Hill Collins was not the one to coin it. Black feminist thought proved to be so important as it transformed both the sociology of race and the sociology of gender, 
and is still frequently cited today. While the first edition of Hill Collins' book does not use intersectionality as a concept, it took off soon after. So in the second edition, there is a significant focus on the concept. While Kimberley Crenshaw coined the term intersectionality, the idea that oppression is multifaceted is certainly found in Hill Collins' book. Most importantly for us, it involves a discussion of intersecting oppressions, the idea that oppression doesn't exist as a simple A to B process. Power and powerlessness are not simply a one-way street. From this, we'll be able to explore the concept of intersectionality and the work of Kimberley Crenshaw before returning to sociological theory. We turn then to Kimberley Crenshaw. As I told you, Kimberley Crenshaw is the first to coin the term intersectionality. However, she's on a road well-traveled, particularly by the work done by Patricia Hill Collins and the long line of black feminist thought that she chronicles in her important book. That should not, however, cause us to overlook the work that Crenshaw has done here in her Demarginalizing the Intersection paper, looking to legal case history and showing the consequences of multiple forms of marginalization. You should read this paper. It is 40 pages if you're wondering why I didn't assign it. No summary can do it justice. I'll give you a sketch, but it will only be a sketch. Let's turn to that paper in detail. In the last video, I explored Dorothy Smith's argument about women's standpoint, singular. A focus on a single standpoint puts forth what Crenshaw calls a single axis framework for addressing inequality. Crenshaw argues that the single axis framework is present in anti-discrimination doctrine, case law, and then dominant feminist theory. That is, each of these spheres tends to take a single variable to represent each of those people within a constituency. We have disabled people, we have women, we have black people, we have men. Each of these constituencies is granted a particular framework and a particular place in discrimination law, in case law, and in the academic exploration of their situation. Thus, internal forms of inequality are overlooked for the single variable that dominates the group. Single axis frameworks force individuals to pick one attribute versus another, and in doing so, overlook oppressions that exist within those constituencies. I'll show you why this matters legally using one of Crenshaw's examples. The situation in De Graffenried versus General Motors was this. Five women brought a suit against General Motors who hadn't hired any black women before 1964 and who in 1970 had fired all the black women working there in a seniority-based layoff. The plaintiffs argued that this was discriminatory under the American Civil Rights Act and that they were discriminated against as black women. However, the court gave a summary judgment for GM, arguing that no, these women were not discriminated against because they had hired black men and they had promoted and hired white women. Because General Motors hired women previously, white women, and black people, men, black women were denied the ability to claim discrimination from the company. It was not simply that black women are intersectional because they are black plus women, but because they are also lumped into other groups, in this case, white women who were hired by General Motors, and this single axis reduction denies them the capacity for group status, and thus the discrimination based on that particular status. The point isn't just focusing on people of multiple identities, it is showing how that multiplicity puts them at a disadvantage when judged by a single axis framework. It is an explanation of how group inclusions and exclusion can be and often are oppressive. In each case, by causing the experience of oppression to follow a single axis framework, we lose the very voices, experience, and potential to aid the people who need the help most, facing multiple modalities of oppression. Here, then, we come to the concept of intersectionality. A lot of people use the term, but often it gets removed from its original context. Crenshaw suggests, as you see on the slide, that the metaphor of the intersection comes to describe exactly how the multiplication problem comes to be. People often claim they are intersectional in their outlook, but looking to Crenshaw's work, we see this is a mistake. Intersectionality, as stated here, isn't a solution, it is a problem to be solved. The long and short of it 
is that single access frameworks are not suited to the internal exclusions that can come up from the emergence and institutional support of the multiplication problem. This is the case in De Graaff and Reed, and it will be in my next example as well. The problem of intersectionality is not about insufficient forms of identity. The problem is that people are forced to pick between the identities that they have. Let me show you again using the example of the library. Consider the case of the Dewey Decimal System, through which all books in the library are categorized. I've put the call numbers for two books I searched for, for this very video. And this is the map of the third floor of the library you get when you click the Show on Floor Plan link on the online catalog. Though I was looking at the same author for each piece, using the same concepts in each of the books, I was forced to walk across the third floor of the library because we have a single access filing system in the Dewey Decimal System. You can either write books on feminist theory and sociology, or you can write books on the sociology of race. No matter how many topics you address in a particular book, you've got to pick one or the other. No matter how many books on race or gender or ability or whatever, the existing framework perseveres. If a book is about all of these things, it still has to go in one spot. Here, there is work that must be done by anybody trying to put these two or more frames of reference together, given the single framework for filing and reading books. Add all the multidisciplinary scholarship you want, but this is the way the books are shelved. Again, like the intersection metaphor, this emphasizes the problematic nature of a single axis framework you have to pick where the book goes. Thus ends this lecture on intersectional feminism by a white guy from Saskatchewan. That's it for me. Now it's your turn. In two paragraphs, between five to eight sentences in length, and with reference to the readings, one, explain the difference between intersecting identities and intersectional oppression. Two, show how that difference manifests in Hill Collins' The Outsider Within.